six reasons why um, I think Liberty is a great choice for for modernization for new app or, or for or for new ac applications. So this is the kind of summary, but I won't re I won't go through each one here because I've got subsequent slides that uh, go into more detail on them. But they on them, but they essentially fall into three categories. Um, so the first is kind of lightweight and highly efficient runtime. So uh, the, these are the characteristics that are going to save you money. Um, so when we compare Liberty to other runtimes, it actually is much more efficient in terms of throughput and memory, and therefore is going to save you a great deal of money. Um, also, you're able to subset the runtime, uh, and I'll talk a bit about that in more detail, which, which again, will save on disk space and memory footprint. Um, also, we focus very hard on optimizing Liberty usage for modern operational practices. Now, these the, the benefits that I'll talk about are actually also useful, even if you're not going to continuous in, moving to do continuous integration or continuous delivery, but you probably want to pick a runtime that's going to enable you to get there once you uh, once you decide to make that move. Uh, and then lastly, we focused a lot on making Liberty a great runtime for containers, Kubernetes, but, but also especially from a developer experience. So the ability to develop applications that are going to work extremely well in a Kubernetes environment, work well in a container environment, and also help you develop in a way that's going to give you less issues once you reach um, production in containers. All right, so let's drill down on each of those a little bit more. So just enough runtime, uh, reason one. So if you think about the different architecture styles that I mentioned, so we've got monolithic applications on the left, macroservices, microservices, and then moving through to functions. As you break an application up into more and more fine-grained uh, deployment units, each one of those actually pulls along its own copy of the runtime. And so there's a cost associated with that, and that's going to be a very real cloud cost if you're deploying those into the cloud, but also a very real on-prem infrastructure cost if you're not. Um, so let's just take an example. If we've got a 200 megabyte runtime that we're using, uh, from, for a monolith, if I'm doing an HA deployment, maybe it's going to be 600 megabytes in total. That might be disk space. It might be memory footprint. Um, if we then move to macroservices, maybe I've got 10 macroservices and I'm scaling them the same way, then that's going to be six gigabytes. If I move to microservices, if I end up with 120 instances, that's 24 gigabytes. If I move to fun functions and I've got 360 instances, then that's 72 gigabytes. And these are all very real costs. So how does Liberty help? Well, if we look at the example on the right-hand side, this is a kind of typical or traditional application server runtime. Um, so this might be a traditional web server, for example. But as, as I said, Liberty has this lightweight kernel. And what we do is we let you configure just the capabilities your application needs. So in this particular example, I'm saying I want MicroProfile 1.0, and that's going to um, pull in the things that are part of MicroProfile 1.0, which would be JAX RS2 and CDI 1.2. If, however, I've decided actually I need I want to move up to the latest MicroProfile level because I want to use my uh, well a, a later MicroProfile level because we're actually up to version four now. Um, but I, and I want to use MicroProfile Config or my MicroProfile Health, then I can just change my server configuration to be MicroProfile 1.2, and it'll pull those capabilities in for me. And so in terms of the features that are available in Liberty, um, this is the kind of a fairly recent, probably possibly even the latest set. Um, all the ones that have the flying saucer symbol next to them are actually open sourced as part of Open Liberty. Um, the ones that aren't, it's not a case that we're keeping back some secret source that you have to pay extra for. Um, they are essentially things that are going to help you with modernization. So um, you probably want to use WebSphere Liberty Base rather than Open Liberty for modernization because it, it includes things like traditional, uh, some, some APIs that are in traditional WebSphere. So that's going to help you migrate. Um, but it, also, the they, we include things that... Um, uh, we released wet before things like Kubernetes were around, so the collective support. So if you're not doing containerized uh, and Kubernetes deployments, then you might want to use Liberty Collectives. But we felt that those things didn't really belong in the open source. And similarly, we didn't want to put WebSphere-centric APIs into, a, into an open source project. But, uh, but Open Liberty is actually a fully functional um, uh, server runtime, uh, perfectly good for, for net new applications. 
Okay, so in terms of just enough runtime, so as I said, you can you can pick and choose what capabilities, and that means you can go all the way down to, uh, for example, servlet, where you'd have tw a 24 megabyte package with 72 megabytes of memory, all the way up to a full uh, full Java e Cartery microprofile package, which would have, in this example, 121 megabytes on disk space and 165 megabytes of memory. And this is going to save you money. It's going to give you faster de deploy times because you're pushing less data around, particularly if you're pushing things around in, in Docker. Um, so pushing Docker images around, for example. And it's really easy to enable it. Uh, you can just um, configure it as part of your Maven plugin or Gradle, uh, Gradle plugins, and the build will create the server runtime for you. OK, next one, low operating costs. So we focus very hard on making Liberty um, a very efficient runtime, the combination of Liberty and OpenJ9. And we think it's important when you're considering the types of applications you're going to create to, to think about what performance characteristics are important for those applications. So we've got kind of three characteristics here, cold startup, memory, uh, memory footprint, and throughput. And actually, cold startup is it is extremely important when you come to things that aren't going to be around for very long. So maybe you're doing serverless things or you're doing functions and so on. Whereas if you actually are starting something up and it's going to receive hundreds or maybe even thousands of requests before it's taken away, uh, which might be a microservice, a macroservice, or a monolith, then cold startup is kind of nice to have, but it's not it's not as important as it is if you're doing functions. Whereas if you look at memory footprint, memory footprint, it's extremely important when it comes to functions, as we saw earlier, but also it's it's important when it comes to monoliths. So, for example, if your runtime is going to use half the memory and therefore potentially save you half your cloud costs, even if it's just in a monolithic application, saving half your cloud costs is probably important to most customers. Uh, lastly, throughput. Um, so as I mentioned with the uh, when I talked about the different characteristics, if you have a network involved, the performance of your runtime is going to be um, skewed uh, by the performance of your network. So throughput is extremely important when it comes to things like monolithic applications and microservices, and probably becomes slightly less important as you go more and more fine grained. So let's have a look at what that means in terms of, or, or how Liberty uh, compares against other runtimes. Um, so these are the latest performance figures um, that we've measured in the last, actually probably the last couple of weeks. This is a day trader eight, so Java E8 application comparison. And we can see that when we use, and this, this is using the default containers for each of the different runtimes. So when we use, um, uh, we can see that Liberty is actually two and a half to four times more efficient in terms of memory. This is when you, we use Liberty in com combination with OpenJ9. Um, and then if we look at throughput, actually Liberty is 70, it has 70 to 208, I've <laughs> made a bit of a mistake with the percentages there, uh, a 70 to 285% um, uh, more efficient than the other runtimes. So in other words, for example, if you used Pyara, you'd need 285% more inst instances of Pyara um, than you would have Liberty. OK, uh, if we now look at uh, uh, Spring, uh, a Spring Boot comparison, um, so we have quite a few customers who are interested in using Spring Boot. You can use Spring Boot um, with Liberty as the, as the, uh, the runtime uh, associated with it. We make it very easy for you to do that. Um, and we found that, and this, this actually bears out in other comparisons where we, uh, for other Tomcat-based runtimes, we found that actually Liberty is, uh, Liberty and OpenJ9 are two, about two times, well, more than two times more efficient uh, in terms of footprint and actually nearly two times um, more efficient in terms of throughput. Uh, and you, you don't need to take our word for it with these measures. Um, the, the example I've got at the bottom isn't actually a Spring Boot example. It's actually a Java E example. Um, however, a major US healthcare provider, they found that they uh, their resource usage was reduced by 75% and infrastructure footprint by 50%. OK, next, continuous delivery. So when you shift from um, a kind of traditional uh, deployment approach, so we, we see this very often. We have development teams and operations, uh, operations teams. And what happens is the development team, they develop the application, uh, they produce a war file, they throw it over the wall to the ops team, and they'll occasionally make updates if they're required to, but they don't typically like doing that. 
On the operational side, the, the ops team, they will deploy the app, they'll handle the automation for the deploy, any deployments and management of the server, they'll monitor the app, they'll maintain the infrastructure for security and things, apply security fixes, and they'll plan and execute migrations, which are actually a significant task typically. However, when we move to a more cloud native approach where the operations team shift to become responsible for a cloud platform, so essentially maybe OpenShift, they manage the cloud platform and they provide services to the applications teams, but there's a shift of all, a lot of the responsibilities that the ops teams had for the individual applications goes over to the development team and they become this kind of multidisciplinary team. So they're now responsible for deploying the app, handling automation, monitoring the app, maintaining infrastructure, applying important security fixes and planning and executing migrations. And typically, and hopefully <laughs> this isn't too rude, we found that development teams actually aren't, are, are, don't, don't, don't typically, they like to write new code, let me put it that way. So how do we help development teams maintain um, the security integrity of the applications that, that they're deploying uh, and, and also not build up a lot, of in, uh, a lot of technical debt? So what Liberty does is it has the continuous delivery model where we release Liberty every four weeks. So these are the numbers that we will release in, in 20, uh, this year. So we did 2104, uh, we might have even done 2105, I'm not sure. Um, and so every four weeks, we'll do a, a new release. For all of the releases, you get five years of support. You get 24 weeks for, for, for the, the four weekly releases support for, for iFixes, and you get proactive security fixes for the most recent. However, there are special quarterly releases, that, so the dot three, dot six, dot nine, dot twelve releases that get increased iFix support, so for two years, and also they get proactive security fixes for the most recent two. So what does that mean in terms of actual adoption of, of Liberty and using using Liberty? So there are we, what we've done is we've enabled two usage patterns. We've enabled the traditional fixed pack usage pattern. So if you just go with the dot three dot six dot nine dot twelve releases, then you're essentially getting the same quality of service, if you like, or same same support. Um, as you would get for traditional WebSphere. However, as you evolve and want to move to a more continuous integration, continuous delivery approach, then the recommendation is you pick up the four weekly releases. You'll get the security fixes uh, applied to those releases. Okay, so I've talked about continuous delivery, but as you probably ex as you've probably experienced with uh, other runtimes such as traditional web or any other runtime out there um, if you move from one release to the next then typically there's a migration involved whereas with liberty what we have is a zero migration policy and what that does is we essentially um, have rules governing how we how we update liberty so we won't change the behavior for configurations existing configurations so if you don't change your ser server configuration the, the runtime behavior won't change we don't change the behavior of features so the the actual implementations of the features will remain same the same in terms of their behaviors you might get security fixes and so on but they won't change behavior and break your applications and we don't remove capabilities so we're not going to take away a capability from you that your application is using so what that means is you can stay current just with a simple repackage, if you like, of your Docker, Docker container. You can do a Docker build and you've picked up the latest. You've got security fixes. Uh, you can skip a, re skip a release and it doesn't introduce migration work. And there's a good chance if you go with the CD releases, the continuous delivery releases, you're never going to have to apply an iFix again. Because actually what we do is if there's a critical security fix, we will repackage that and re-release the Docker images. And we actually update the Docker images, not just every four weeks, but every week. Um, and you don't need to take our word for it. So um, Handles Bank and they went through a migration exercise. They used to use traditional WebSphere and it used to take them 18 months to plan um, that exercise and, and go through a migration. Um, they went through a migration uh, for, of Liberty versions, but they also moved Java E7 to Java E8 and they did it in 18 minutes for all of their applications. Okay, next one, Kubernetes optimized. So we do a great deal uh, to kind of optimize the experience um, for, for Kubernetes. Um, so if you think about how you, how you um, performance tune, for example, today, uh, you will typically set up an environment. You'll try, try and have that environment mimic what production is gonna look like. You'll run some tests and you'll tune the runtime until you get what you think is the best performance out of that runtime. However, if you're 
developing containers, packaging containers, you don't necessarily know what the production environment is going to look like. And that might change over time. Latency of requests can change over time. So with Liberty, what we do is we have a, it, it essentially auto tunes its thread pool um, to the environment. So as the environment changes, Liberty will continue to give you the optimal performance. Um, we also have top to bottom support. So with the WebSphere product, um, we, pro we provide support for the server, we provide support for the Java. We build um, UBI images. So then if you're deploying into, into a Red Hat environment, so if you're on the OpenShift container platform, you'll also, as part of IBM and Red Hat, get support for the OS layer as part of those container images. Um, we provide an operator. It's called the Open Liberty Operator, but it actually works uh, and is supported with WebSphere Liberty as well. Um, and that operator gives you a really simple experience for deploying, and I'm going to demonstrate that in a little while, deploying applications into Liberty, uh, sorry, into, into a, Liberty applications into a Kubernetes environment. And it also supports data operations. So, uh, for example, capturing traces and dumps. Um, we release all our images into into Docker Hub um, so that they're readily available for you for building your own your own packages. We also open source the files, the Docker files used to build those images, so you can create your own custom images which are still supported. And we provide APIs that help you integrate your applications with Kubernetes environments. So, uh, MicroProfile has APIs, to, for example, to uh, integrate with the Kubernetes health uh, health probes, so uh, liveness, readiness, for example. Okay, last, last of the six reasons, developer experience. So I mentioned that one of the goals of Liberty was to help developers be more productive. And we've, we've kept that goal uh, in mind as we've evolved Liberty over the past eight or nine years. Uh, and we've, we focused very hard on enabling the developer um, IDEs of choice. So providing plugins into Eclipse, VS Code, IntelliJ, for example. Um, we've also created something called Dev Mode, which I'll demo in a, a little while, which is uh, essentially gives you a, a, a rapid in a loop developer experience. And we also have something called Dev Mode C, which lets you do that development in containers. We release everything into, into popular public rep repositories, which makes it easier for you to consume and use the runtime. We support popular build environments, so Maven and Gradle. We've got plugins that make it easy to develop and deploy applications um, using Liberty. Um, we provide popular APIs, so Java EE, Jakarta EE is the kind of future path for Java EE, MicroProfile for integrating um, microservice uh, or cloud technologies, uh, and Spring Boot. If you want to run Spring Boot on, uh, uh, on Liberty, you can do that, and we provide uh, a feature that makes, uh, makes that easy. Uh, testing, of course, we can't forget testing, so you can easily do tests with JUnit. We've got integration into our Killian for integration tests. Uh, and we've got microshed testing that enables you to do in-container testing. Uh, 